Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's Sense of Feely Sparring Partners webinar on 3.45 gigahertz Open RAN CBRS, what will happen in wireless in the US in 2022. Now, because the FCC has not released all the data around the 3.45 gigahertz auction, probably won't touch much on that topic today, but we'll save it for a future webinar. Our speakers today are Amit Nagpal, partner at Etha Consulting, former FCC Commissioner Mike O'Reilly of MP O'Reilly Consulting, Ern Worthman, industry analyst and editor at AGL and 6G World, and Monica Paolini, principal at Sensafili. I'm Kendra Chamberlain, and I will be moderating our webinar today. Inspiring Partners webinars, we watch our debaters discuss a video live, discuss a topic live on video and without slides. We'd like to encourage our audience to participate in the conversation. Please share your comments and questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. All comments are visible to all participants, so please keep the conversation polite and respectful. Our speakers will do their best to address questions as they go along and as they become relevant to the topics being discussed. So please do not hold your questions until the end. And a quick tip for our viewers, feel free to share your comments through the Q&A button instead of the chat function because our uh, speakers do not monitor the chat during the webinar and they may not see the comment. Okay, with that, I'll hand it over to Monica. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, again, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And th this is kind of a, a weird for sparring partners, but we have uh, um, most of the, the same uh, um, uh, sparring partners that we had last time, because uh, uh, last time we tried to talk about uh, the 3.45 gigahertz auction 110, and the data was not available. So we thought we reschedule it, and we did reschedule it, and it's <laughs> still not available. So you will have to take us uh, and uh, talk about uh, uh, US. It, it turns out that last time we had more things to talk about that we did. So we have plenty to talk about that we didn't cover last time. And uh, you can watch, however, the previous sparing partners if you would like to. Uh, and I'm going to send you the, the link in a second. Um, and uh, today, so today we have uh, uh, Mike and Amit that were also on our panel, um, uh, on our Spanish partners uh, in December, and Ern, who is the new guy on the block. And I've known Ern forever. So uh, anyway, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about uh, uh, what's up, what's new about wireless in the US, what's, what's coming up since the beginning of the year, what's uh, coming up for 2002, but we're going to go beyond 2002 and you're going to start talking even about a uh, little bit about uh, uh, 6G, metaverse, 5G advanced, all of those things. So um, said that, let's get started with the usual introduction. And since Ern is new, I think, Ern, why don't you tell us who you are and uh, what you do? Thanks, Monica. Appreciate it. My name is Ernest Worthman. Um, I'm actually the principal of an, a company called Worthman and Associates. We're industry analysts. Um, under that, I do a lot of editorial work. I'm the executive editor for AGL Media Group, and I'm also a contributing editor to 6G World. And technically, credentially, I'm a senior member of the IEEE. There you have it, in a nutshell. Perfect. Mike, how about you? Pleasure to be back. Thanks so much, Monica. Mike O'Reilly. Uh, I'm a former FCC commissioner. I now run my own consulting firm for tech and select tech and telecom companies. Uh, prior to coming to the FCC, where I spent seven years, I spent 20 years on Capitol Hill, 11 years in the Senate, nine years in the House, um, and enjoyed my time there. Very good. So you know all the, the, the intricacies <laughs> of that part of the world. Amit, what about you? Right, thanks, thanks, Monica. Thank you very much for, for inviting me back again in the in this uh, new year and happy new year to everybody in the audience. Um, so I'm Amit Nagpal. I'm one of the uh, partners at Ether Consulting, and we're a boutique uh, consultancy firm advising on uh, telecom issues, typically strategic and, and and regulatory issues. Perfect. So <clears throat> okay, so again. 3.45 is not much to talk about, although I guess we know who pretty much the winners are. Um, so let, let's see about, let's 
you know, look into what, what's, uh, uh, what's coming up. And um, as we were preparing, it seemed like, you know, open RAN comes top of mind. You know, everybody talks. It's, it seems like it's, it's like 5G a few years ago. You can never talk enough about open RAN because there is always something. So um, should we just give like a quick, uh, the, the top of the view, what, what do you think about open RAN? And maybe, Ern, since you again, since you're the new one, maybe you can go first about that. And then we can just keep going. And, uh, and by the way, everybody in the audience, make sure you ask your questions as we go along, uh, because there is no Q&A at the end. We take the questions as we go. So, Ern. Thank you, you, Monica. Well, as the resident geek, um, I kind of look at the technology more than I do um, the way people like Mike and Emmett do. They they understand a lot different perspective than I do. So I kind of stay drilled down on the, the technology of it. And the one thing, the opening statement, the vo volley, if you, uh, if you may, about Open RAN is that there's no lack of opinions about what is going to happen with ORAN. Um, there's people out there that say it's going to save 5G. There's people out there that say it'll never happen. So those are the two points that I spend a lot of time talking to people about from a technical perspective. Um, and I'm sure that either, um, either Amit or, or Michael have some interesting takes on that statement. So I'm going to stop with that and turn it over to one of those and let's see, one of them, I should say, and let's see where this conversation goes with that. Yes, absolutely. Now, Mike, I saw you were wanted to say something. Oh, I was going to defer, but, I, but I'll, I'll take it on. Um, I, look, at I, I know we're sparring here, but I don't think we're too dissimilar. Um, I think there are benefits to open RAN, and I think it will become secondary. It will become second nature to providers to, to because the, the operators have asked for it and demanded it as part of their future contracts. Its significance is still open for debate. You know, I think everyone will do it, um, and there'll still be a, to, to my knowledge, there's still going to be a proprietary component. They'll, you know, the, the idea of being completely open, I think, is, is, is unrealistic. Um, but I think that there, you know, it will be done, um, and then its significance is still still to be determined. And there are there are downsides to to, to open RAN on the security side. And there's also been this conversation. And I've talked about this in a blog not too long ago, and I'll I'll post it in the in the chat or a link anyway. There's a downside to uh, to having open RAN because it, it is it is starved the conversation for what you know who makes the equipment uh, and who is good and who is bad, and we've labeled this, you know, kind of anyone not domestic um, as a problem uh, company, and that's just not accurate. Uh, many of the global equipment providers uh, provide a number of benefits and, and serve the U.S. marketplace and exist to the market share for lots of different reasons why we are where we are, um, and we shouldn't, you know, denigrate the work that they do um, on the idea that, this, that somehow the domestic providers are better off when most of their work is actually offshore. So, I'll, I'll I'll leave it leave it there and happy to happy to follow up. Well, and actually, I would add to that it's not just security; it's not just an equipment issue, especially as it becomes more of a software. Uh, I mean, the 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 whole RAM, the software becomes more important in the way you you uh, have the RAM. So the physical elements are not just the only source of. Uh, security threats and you have security threats no matter who the vendor is you know you know regardless security is, is such a major issue that you have to deal it in a much more fundamental way just, just excluding a vendor doesn't solve any security i mean you might solve some security problem clearly you don't want to have unsecure hardware but that's not just because you have that you're not going to have a secure network and I think that the, the issue with, with open RAN security is that security, and this is in general with virtual networks, the, the question of how you manage security is different. So I think that they can be secure, but it's a different way to, you need to approach security. So that's, anyway, I mean, so I have, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 no problem. So I think I was just gonna say really that I think what's been interesting is how the sort of concept of open RAN, you know, open interfaces and everything has been sort of all bundled in together with the whole security, Huawei, Chinese vendors thing. And that's sort of, sort of, it's sort of gone in a sort of different direction to the way it might have gone, if, if, if you see what I mean. And probably now a lot of the discussion about open RAN is all about the security side rather than sort of underlying technology side, if, if you like, which is about having open interfaces. 
I mean, you know, in terms of where we're going, I mean, you know, like we've uh, we've, we've also written a sort of uh, thought piece on this at Ether, and kind of thing is we sort of see three phases. I mean, we sort of see an early phase over the next few years where basically, obviously, people are trying open RAN, getting interested in it. Um, you know, a key precursor for open RAN is the virtualization of networks, which is taking place by operators and the likes. And all this process is sort of running through in the next few years. And then sort of, I don't know, sort of late 20s, 2020s, 2025, 26 to 2030, perhaps start seeing more open RAN coming in. But I think we kind of see open RAN really coming in in the sense of all equipment will be open RAN because that's what everybody's asking for. But I think one of the myths about open RAN is it's going to suddenly lead to operators buying from 30 or 40 different suppliers, you know, different bits of the network. And the truth is, it's twofold there. Number one, operators do already indirectly buy from many vendors. So when you go to Ericsson or Nokia or Huawei in the case of in the past and the rest of the world for their sort of turnkey solution, those vendors are actually putting together equipment from other providers, you know, Andrew's antennas or whoever, you know, whatever it may be as part of their solution. So number one, that is already happening. And number two, the reason it's happening through an Ericsson or Nokia or the likes is because operators want to go to one party. They want one party to be their systems integrator for want of a better phrase. Um, I don't think operators want to end up buying from multiple suppliers. So probably what will happen is a continuation, if you like, of of um, going to two or three main parties who then use other parties as part of their solution, but with everything badged as open RAN, if, if I want a better yeah. phrase. Well, and in fact, you know, you can have an open RAN, you know, network where you have a single vendor. Um, so it's just a, a way of having the interfaces. So it's a way to have a, a future proof network, if you wish. So on day one, you can still have similar the same uh, vendor so you don't have to integrate across different vendors which is still not trivial um so uh you know uh i would imagine that at the beginning you might see a lot of open running technically open run networks that are not necessarily do not have necessarily too many vendors and you know uh how many vendors so so i think that there is a value to openness that uh, it goes beyond having multiple vendors because you are it's a protective way to 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 pick your vendors and then yeah in some cases you might want to have different vendors but you don't need to have a different vendor every different corner no and i think to be honest having open run is a good thing because what it is doing very much so even if even if operators still end up going to nokia or Exxon or whoever for the main vendor it's still not a bad thing because it brings some competitive tension into the market i mean particularly in markets which have used some of the Chinese vendors, you know, a lot of the, a lot of European countries, for, for example, operators there, you know, Huawei is a major supplier uh, up to now. Now, if you take Huawei away, there's, a, you know, potentially lessening of competition in that market and perhaps some, you know, potential scope for sort of price increases. Now, bringing this sort of whole, whole open round dimension into this potentially provides another source of uh, provision and keeps some competitive tension going in that market. So. You know, it may be in the, in the sort of late 20s, open, you know, new open brand vendors don't take much market share, but they probably keep the bigger, the bigger, you know, the big vendors, if you like, honest in terms of their pricing in the way that, you know, if you like the Huawei, by, and, and, and like by adding competitive tension to the market done. And maybe it's the 2030s, maybe, you know, look to jumping ahead to the discussion a little bit, maybe it's sort of, you know, some 6G where open RAN really comes into a bit more of its own uh, at that point. Yes, you're gonna get no. Before, let me ask you this. So, you know, I think that it, it, should Huawei do open RAN because it's not a good way to kind of get in. I mean, or does I mean, it doesn't really matter because you I, know if people are not gonna get, you know. Well, I was gonna say I, I suspect it will end up doing so because the, the whole thing is the way this the industry works is it follows standards, and if the standard standard is to do open RAN, then I suspect everybody will have Huawei will end up doing open RAN eventually, even if it's not part of the alliance today, it will end up doing so. But as you rightly say, the, you know, the, the, the restrictions on uh, vendors is, is not specific to open RAN or whether they're using open RAN or not, it's more specific to their, you know, their ownership. And, you know, as Mike's paper points out, you can get into all sorts of discussions about, you know, ownership, who, where your, where your headquarters is located, where you where, 
where, where you're notionally owned, who owns you, and uh, uh, where your actual people are, where the development is taking place. And it's a whole mix of those things. But, uh, you know, probably the whole principles of keeping Huawei out are probably still going to apply for some years yet, I suspect, regardless of whether they're open RAN compliant or not. Yeah, I mean, I, open RAN to me made a lot more sense when, you know, we were we, prior to number of governments making decisions on Huawei and some of the Chinese, Chinese manufacturers are part of the uh, alliance mm -hmm. in helping to draft the standards. So I suspect they're going to move in that direction. Some of them select, obviously. Uh, and that's been tension points on the, the, the standardization process. So th that will come about. So it made a lot more sense once, you know, the idea was that you could break up the, you know, the end-to-end -end network, and therefore you could have a more secure, if you wanted to change out a piece that you thought was less secure for, you know, and, and certainly you know, Huawei wasn't ready and prepared for this, so it provide some, you know, and then the second part was it had a, an influence on cost, and we're going to see some cost savings, and that part hasn't really developed yet, and it probably may take the time that, I mean, talks about, you know, 2030 or something that we'll have to see if the cost develops, but overall, it's not a, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a policy that's, it makes a lot of sense and it will move the, the, the doll, you know, move the conversation forward. And so we'll have a, a network that can be much more interchangeable. I don't know that providers are going to use it that way as, as some of the panelists described. You know, from a, from one of the perspectives that I, when I talk to people about, of course, is on the technical end. And there's two huge questions that kind of pop up. And one of them is, what happens if I lose a piece of open RAN equipment? Is there going to be some sort of vetted um, process that says, you, this is yours, um, Nokia, this is yours, um, Qualcomm, this is yours, Samsung. Are you going to take responsibility for this? Is there going to be a third party integrated uh, network that's going to take over the, the stack when something goes wrong? Um, and what about the liability of it? What happens if one of your open RAN pieces takes down a network or opens up to a, a virus or some sort of other attack? They're like, how do we deal with this? How are we going to do this? If we were one single source vendor, we could beat them up and say, it's your fault, you fix it. With open RAN, that's kind of a questionable um, an, an, an option there for some of these vendors. So, uh, 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 sorry, yeah. no, 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 go ahead. No, I'm just going to say, I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of exactly why, you know, I, I certainly believe that, you know, operators are going to continue buying from, you know, a major vendor or, you know, split it up into regions, you know, in the south we buy from Ericsson, in the north we buy from Nokia or whatever, because they, they do want one party to, to take responsibility for the whole systems integration, if you like, and one party to go to, um, because as you say, if, if, you're, if you're integrating from 10 plus vendors, you need to have a very competent team internally, you know, a lot of skill, a lot of expertise and a lot of skills. And even then, you know, when you do have a problem, you can imagine A saying, yeah, well, it's because of B didn't give us, you know, the, the interface between B didn't give us this. And they say, well, you, you're supposed to give us, you, you can imagine the whole blame game would, would just go on. And operators, I don't think, want to get involved in any of that. So the, I, I think the real question is, would you see some new form of system integrator in addition to an Ericsson or Nokia? So, you know, Rakuten, for example, is is is, is trying to take that role in, in Germany. You know, it's, it's playing that role to one-on-one uh, -on -one drillish is rolling out a new mobile network there. And it's buying an open RAN solution, but it's buying it from, from Rakuten. So Rakuten is essentially playing that role of systems integrate. So one-on-one -on -one drillish has one party to go to to, 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 to there. And when you see someone like that coming into the market as a, as another major provider that that will be an interesting thing yeah but but then but then isn't that an issue that the whole idea of openness kind of like you just get uh, the the closure as a different point because then you become dependent on rakuten on your so if rakuten can doesn't work for you anymore then you still have a you have a, in fact you have a bigger problem because you still have all those vendors well the other thing is also that uh, right now the interoperability is a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. So two vendors interoperate, but it's not, you don't have a certification thing like you'd have it with the Wi-Fi Alliance, for instance. And it's difficult to know whether it would ever even happen. But so if you're an operator, even on day one, you need to make sure that everybody can play together. That, this, that's, that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of work. And, we still and this really is one of the big issues that much of a standard. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we still don't have much of a standard. 
Um, and there's actually some question whether the ORAN alliance is going to emerge as a global standard for ORAN. All this stuff is keeping people from what I would consider dipping more than a toe in it at the moment, I think. Yeah, I, was, I think I was going to say something not too dissimilar to you in that I was going to say, I mean, I think this is the big reason why we're not seeing uh, a lot, you know, a lot of uh, operators with existing networks right. coming and take up open RAN to start with. You know, it's it's really been the new greenfield players, the Dishes, uh, the Rakutens and, and Grillish in Germany, because they've got a clean slate. You don't have to integrate with 10 years of, you know, maybe even longer, 20, 30 years in some cases of legacy equipment. So it's it's a lot easier to do. But and as you say, you know, let's let's be absolutely honest about it. If you're if you're one of those providers of legacy equipment, is it in your interest to make everything fully open and everything nice and easy to integrate with you? Probably not. You're probably not going to make life easier for someone who's trying to integrate with your old legacy equipment. So you can see why uh, why uh, uh, operators with legacy are being much more cautious, shall we say? But I, I would add to that, and, and I don't know if I disagree with what you said, but I think you have to you know, keep in mind the importance of how software is going to change from just being a function today to being the driving factor. Mm -hmm. And I think the second component that, you know, is being lost, not, not here, but in general is, you know, what's the role of, for lack of better, I'll call it the cloud provider, um, you know, the, the cloud universe taking over the telecom space, right? They're becoming both a, a, an offer or, you know, of service to, to telecoms and also directly offering service themselves. And does everything move to some of the big cloud providers and, you know, our current operators, you know, completely, uh, change in that universe, and and the the technology will change with it. And so, the you know, it, it's not 1990, uh, and we're talking about you know stacks anymore. I think this universe is you know virtualization, as you talked about. The, you know, all those things matter here um, and make it much more both complex and also a very changing dynamic. That you know, some of this conversation is a little, some of the debate on ORAN, for instance, is a little static. And uh, Mike, I think you've, uh, you've, you've mentioned what I always think of the sort of the elephant in the room that never gets mentioned, which is, you know, a lot of the discussion is on the whole sort of dominance of Ericsson, Nokia and the likes. And exactly as you say, we're, we're moving to a sort of software world hosted on cloud networks. And this is more and more being hosted on, you know, you know, uh, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, you know, and so on. And, and really the, the, the real dominance issue, if you like, is really those cloud providers. I mean, you know, how many of them are there actually going to be? And, you know, we're not just talking about the communication sector, we're talking about so much of our lives being hosted there. So all, all we're in a sense we're doing is with, with potentially with open RAN and virtualization, if, if virtualization is going to mean cloud, we're just adding to that increasing dependence on the big two, three, four, whatever you want to describe it as. And really addressing the Ericsson Nokia thing is, you know, it's, 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 it's addressing the small problem, not the real big problem in, in a sense for the world well, I'm, still, I'm still a fan of i'm still a big fan of, of what you know ericsson and nokia and samsung are able to bring to the table and i think they're going to be around for a very long time i just think that the, the market is changing and they are changing quickly and adopting and and, and embracing oran so give them credit for for doing that i just i think the people hold out hope that it's this great savior and i think it's it's probably you know less significant overall than than what people want it to be yeah. Well, I will take a different uh, tack on this. Like you know, you, you said, I mean, that it's a problem. The 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 cloud providers. I think it's a, it's a sort of big opportunity, and it's going to be a challenge for the operators. Uh, but and uh, especially when you get look at the in the enterprise market. So <clears throat> initially, I thought, well, you know, in in an in a private network, why do you want to use Open RAN? I mean, you don't need you know. Why the complication? But when you think about it, it's actually different because if you have AWS provide, coming in with a solution yeah, yeah. and they bring the hardware, then the open run kind of fits in nicely because it gives you more flexibility. So AWS can use different vendors. So it's not necessarily that the enterprise needs to have 10 different run vendors for their own network, but they can just use whatever they need. So they have flexibility. So I think that that's kind of where having an open and, and sort of open um, standard, standards, uh, interfaces, that might help, uh, for instance, the enter private, uh, private networks. Indeed, and I think for smaller organizations, you know, if small in, in, in the sense of 
their tele, you know, the telecoms capability. You know, it might be a big organization like Volkswagen or, or, or whatever. But using a, a, a using a, a cloud provider to help with uh, deploying a private network, you can see makes a lot of sense. Well, I think my concerns are more about if you take a, a, a an AT and T or Verizon, you've got say you've got AT and T, you know, deciding to 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 use one of the cloud providers one day for 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 for, for all its processing. What if one day it wants to move? You know, it's very, it's going to be quite difficult to move from one cloud provider to another. I mean, there's going to be a, a lot of lock-in and how much competition is there going to be in that market in, in any case, you know? And I say, this is much wider than telecoms. This is a much wider issue for, for society, almost any industry that, because all industries are, you know, making use of cloud one way or another. So, it's, And I uh, think that that relates to the question that we have uh, uh, from the audience. It's a, it's a service provider like one one picks a supplier or Accutan. Is there not? vendor lock-in what is open about it which i think is the same issue you're raising so it's just that you're just going to be locked in unless the operator decides to do everything in-house which is difficult mm. then you do end up having a different type of lock-in you know in the end i mean from my perspective in a high level perspective there's and and I think Mike said it the best. There's going to be use cases for ORAN where they're perfect. There's going to be use cases for ORAN where they're, they don't really need ORAN. Um, and it can scale all the way from what Emma just said, huge telecoms or even cases like VW, use cases like VW. And we don't, I don't really see a clean solution right now. I don't see how this is going to roll forward. I think there's a lot of um, evolution in this particular part of the, the network itself. And it could be completely different three years from now because we continue to build these 5G um, websites and access points and um, towers and all this stuff without Open RAN at this point. So the longer we do this and the longer it takes Open RAN to become an accepted standard or a group um, technology, for lack of a better term, the more difficult it is going to be to put this into effect in a brownfield situation as you talk uh, you and I talked about yesterday. So I think it's still a fairly, um, I think it's still a fairly fluid platform. And I think changes are coming that we may not necessarily see at the moment um, that we've all as the years go by. That's my kind of high level um, take on it. So we, we have another question from the audience. Uh, David Smith that says, uh, talks about system integrator are absolutely an essential for all but large public networks. And this will impact the cost uh, in part due to risk premiums and, and ch um, ch charges to cover hard to predict liabilities. And I would say that system integrators are essentially meant for the big guys. Um, they just use them in different ways. Um, so my comment was not that they're not, they're absolutely necessary. And in fact, it's a, it's a great thing to have a system integrator because operators are not gonna be able to do everything end to end. It's just no, well, there is no point because they would be reinventing the wheel internally. The question is, I think, to how do you do it in a way that uh, you still preserve openness? And so if you just go through the Rakuten kind of model where you just have them come in and take care of everything in the network, uh, that might be an issue. But that doesn't mean that it's not necessary. I think that we just need to think of the, 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 the sort of the, the ecosystem in a different way. And I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah, and I, and I think it sort of goes on. I mean, we've got a comment from uh, Tom Kraft, which sort of uh, leads into this a little bit, which is, you know, open RAN creates options and flexibility. An integrator can choose to use it or not. But if a particular supplier stumbles, then a shift to a new supply becomes a shorter development time cycle. And I think that's a good point, you know, in the sense of, you know, if there's a particular component that does a particular function and for, for whatever reasons that it, the supplier doesn't work out or whatever, because the standards are, you know, open, it's much easier for someone else to come in. In fact, there probably is, there probably are other people already in that, in that part of the value chain, if you like, or that product um, that, that are there that you can switch to. So having those options uh, is always good. I mean, remember, and again, I just go back to the very first thing I said, you know, some of this is already happening. You know, there are, you know, Ericsson and Nokia are not just using one antenna provider. They, they go, they're buying from several. So these things are already happening. I think this is just taking an existing thing, but widening out. And it's, it's a good thing in that sense. But this idea that I think what I'm skeptical about is this idea that, 
you know, 80, suddenly 80% 80 of equipment that's bought on radio networks is not going to come from big vendors. It's going to come from a multitude of, uh, or, you know, from, from smaller providers. I think, I think that's, uh, that, that's probably taking it a bit too far. Yeah. I agree with you, Emmett. I think that's a well taken point. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, again, the, there's going to be more variety and with openness and flexibility, you have more variety. So you don't necessarily, you know, you probably have even more than one system integrator, more vendors. And I think that, that what that means is for an operator is that you need to become more flexible as to the parties you're dealing with. So you're not dealing with one or two vendors. You just, I mean, uh, you just have to have a broader scope, which is, which is good. Because you're going to learn much more. You're going to be, you know, as long as you know, I guess that what I don't see happening is that to have every operator starting from scratch and doing it on their own. I just don't think it's feasible, even for the big ones. I think the operator cares about, you know, I want service quality to be a certain level and I want cost to be less, right? Uh, and I don't want to deal with a thousand vendors. Um, so we're going to have to deal with some kind of system integrator or I'm moving traffic to the cloud or I'm going to be a partnering. To the mid point, I was wondering, you know, at what point uh, do the existing operators, you know, s stop shifting traffic and functionality to cloud and become their own provider, right? Why is AT&T mm -hmm. not a cloud provider, uh, or at least a substantial cloud provider? That is something that in the past they would have been, they would have been the leading, and now they're they're much more of a follower. Does that change over time, or does the cloud universe subsume into that universe and make the operators less, you know, relevant? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. It seems every time we thought that the operators were going to be, you know, I think back to the 90s um, and we had, you know, and after the 96 Telecom Act and we, you know, open up the networks. And then at the same time, the Internet universe is is stealing all the market share and all the traffic and everything else right right beside it. So uh, I, I don't know where that ends in the, in the, as the cycle goes. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, so the, there is a similar. So there is one. Uh, so Tom talks about uh, the. Um, keeping the costs down. So, you know, having more open, I mean, open standards. But then uh, there is also another question about talking about, then it could be that the hardware cost savings uh, will move to the integration and maintenance costs. And uh, I sent a link about, I did a lot of TCO work on this. And uh, so it, it, the, the business case is very easy for if you are a Greenfield operator, the Rakuten and Dish. Clearly, if you if you are not, it, it becomes more complicated. So I think that realistically, you should you, you need to think about the fact that the equipment cost can be lower, but you're gonna have higher integration costs at the beginning. Uh, and uh, so I think that if you just look at the very short term cost savings, uh, you might not see that, but that's okay because in a lot of cases it's good. You know, you you just need. To, it's, it is expensive to move to something new, uh, but then in the long term, you're going to see the benefit. So I think that, uh, you know, just be, the equipment costs are like 20% of your deployment cost. So even if that drops a bit, that's not enough. But I think it's really important to keep in mind the long term goal here. You have, as an operator, you have to make some investment in changing the way you deal with the RAM. So, there is a cost, I think, but uh, in the short, in, at the beginning, but then it would just go down. And I don't know what you guys think about that. Well, just just even in related to the cost, I mean, one interesting comment I heard made on the uh, whole open run was from mm -hmm. Neil McRae, who is the, um, I, I don't know his official title, but he's kind of the sort of chief technical architect of BT's network in the, in, in, in the UK, uh, kind of one down from the CTO, if you like. And he made an interesting point, which was that, you know, he's, he's, he's worked with a lot, a lot, you know, 40, 50 years or whatever is his career. He's done a lot of hardware stuff. He's done a lot of software stuff. And the point that he made was that, you know, if, you know, open run is a lot about moving hardware to software, but the costs don't get cheaper, you know, but the costs of coding and fixing the bugs in coding and the cost of the software engineers that you need to do that is not cheaper than producing hardware. So there, there is no implicit sudden cost saving from this just, just because of the technology side. Uh, if you like. So I thought that was a very interesting point, especially coming from, you know, someone like BT, who obviously looks at, you know, they have their own research facilities and, you know, they're, they're not just a buyer of equipment. They really do look into technology very carefully. Well, and it's important to your point, though, is like, how is, how, where is the coding done, right? If, it, you know, if, if, if security is the issue, 
we know a lot of coding is, is, is shipped overseas and that's that's acceptable um but it's, it, you know to the idea that it's going to you know make it more secure is is is, is of, of of question in my mind yeah. Well, one thing that is different, though, if you have more uh, software costs, is sometimes the costs are different. I mean, they're different uh, in from a financial point of view, become, become, become more of an OPEX cost. So it's a software license. Started. But again, that's um, uh, you're not going to move to open RAN just because you get more OPEX and less CAPEX. <laughs> but, but it's something to keep in mind, I guess. Um, Okay, now we have some more. There is a question about Qualcomm coming up with BUs or RU SOCs. You see this accelerating market adoption. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, the more, you know, I don't know if you guys have anything. I, you know, Monica, I think what he's asking, you know, is mm -hmm. as the hardware becomes more integrated, as the chips and everything become more multifunction, um, there is going to be, the direct answer to him is yes, there's going to be an acceleration um, in market adoption, not with the circumstances that will lay the groundwork for whether or not this person or that person wants the RAN, but in terms of the hardware and the technology that will become available uh, will accelerate um, in, so that people, perhaps the uh, integration will be easier and again, maybe a little bit cheaper, that kind of stuff. That's where the hardware pushes things forward a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Now we also have another question about uh, security and Huawei. I'm going to read it. So a multitude of countries have expressed security concerns about Huawei. However, there are greater than four, more than 40 Chinese based entities enrolled as members in the Oran Alliance. If the Oran protocols are widely accepted, would countries be trading one known security concern in Huawei for a plethora of smaller vendors that might pose their own security concerns. It goes exactly to Mike's point about it. where's the software coding being done, really. Well, yeah. and I guess that's true, you know, that, yeah, you, you don't know, you don't really necessarily, so you just need to look at security at the kind of, uh, again, a different level. You need to make sure you're able to detect security threats in a sort of regardless since you don't know you just don't trust anybody basically mm. but, the, but the interesting thing this this concept of you know if you like handling security at a different le level through encryption and all that i think i think if you like that was originally the uk's perspective on the whole huawei issue you know we can we can handle the fact that our you know traffic is you know our sensitive traffic is going through huawei equipment mm -hmm. because essentially we're going to make sure it's it's encrypted or whatever you know we're going to handle it above above the network uh, layer, if you like, but you know there was a change of policy, and you know whether that was political reasons or not, one can speculate. But there's a change of policy, which then led to the UK government saying, "No, actually, we can't do that." And part of the excuse for that was because uh, the Chinese vendors, Huawei and the likes, don't have access to, if you like, Western chipsets that therefore increases that risk and, and the likes. One can debate whether that was a fudge or whatever, but uh, you know, essentially, the the, 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 the bottom line is. You know that, that that this idea that you could just do it at a high level was 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 taken away in the UK. We we had to have security at the the network hardware level uh, as well, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, security is not it's 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 more complex. That you know, there's no single policy that can address the whole security issue, and it's a complete it continues to evolve. You don't solve security; you just learn to manage it, mm. or you know. Yeah, and security, I mean, there's been chats from a technical perspective about embedding security in the hardware um, at the fabric level where it's just in there and whoever gets the chipset, they get that security layer and there's no ability to modify or uh, compromise it. And that's been talked about for years. It hasn't been done at this point very, uh, very strongly because it's an expensive endeavor and it kind of if the chip evolves, the entire security fabric uh, layer has to be kind of redone. But that's where the real solution is to all this, regardless of who manufactures the equipment, whether it's Qualcomm, Huawei, Ericsson, it doesn't matter. If you can get the security in at the fabric level, then you solve a lot of problems. Um, but it's just slow to be have been adopted. They just don't do much with it, um, sadly. Yeah. It's just easier to just have a 
software. Other software. different, other different yeah. strategies to deal with security, I guess. It's cheaper, and I mean the bottom line is security is an extremely um, expensive overhead piece for almost every company. It's not something they want to do; it's something they have to do, and they'd rather somebody else do it if they had their choices, but they don't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, now we wanted to talk about six G, but before we go there, um, we had a question before from uh, um, before the the sparring partners on uh, 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 wireless FWF. Uh, using 3.5, I would say that you know that's not only the only option you can. In fact, most of the attention these days in the U.S. is on using millimeter wave for fixed uh, uh, wireless access. And I think that uh, you know uh, it's not going to replace fiber, but if you can use it to fill in the gaps, that's uh, that's that's pretty good. But it's still not going to be a major. I don't I don't think it's going to be a major driver. Uh, so sometimes it's just in, in, the, in the U.S. it's kind of marketed like, you know, the big 5G opportunity. Well, really, I don't know. What do you guys think? I'm a big fan of, of, of fixed X, you know, fixed wireless access. I'm a big, I, I think it can be a competitor for, mo for multiple services that consumers get. It's not going to feed the enterprise market necessarily, depending on, you know, who the vendor is. But, but I think there's value here, and I think it's going to steal customers from you know many of the wireline providers, and so now what particular bands they use for that? I, I don't know that it's necessarily going to be the CBRS band versus C band versus 2.5, depending on the you know I don't know where exactly, and, and maybe you know, there's definitely a millimeter wave that will be part of the equation. I, I don't know that it really matters about what band they use. I just think that there's there's there going to be a competitive layer, a competitive element that's brought forward by 5G technologies. Um, and whereas the consumer doesn't care what the technology is going into their house, they don't care how they get broadband. They just want broadband at, a, at an, a, a, an adequate speed and adequate functionality. Um, and so if, if fixed wireless can do that, great. Um, if others can, great. We're, we're the, you know, behind that, they don't really care which band it uses. No consumer cares. Um, and they also don't care about, you know, after a certain level of speed, they don't really care. Does it meet their family's needs is really the ultimate goal. I think I think the big challenge for sort of uh, mobile operators, particularly perhaps internationally, is, is the whole issue of a, a sort of limited amount of spectrum. And if you've got a limited amount of spectrum, you want to revenue maximize from that spectrum. And the big problem is, you know, a, 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 you know, a typical mobile subscriber it varies from country to country, but it's something most countries it's in the order of five to 10 gigabytes a month. A home broadband user, you know, gets through 300 to 500 gigabytes a month. And, you know, the revenue you get does not multiply up in, in those proportions. You know, you might get twice the revenue from a home broadband subscriber as you might get from a mobile subscriber. So your revenue per, per bit or byte or whatever is, is, is much, you know, at least one order of magnitude and possibly even in some cases two orders of magnitude lower for, 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 for uh, a fixed wireless solution, a, a, a home broadband solution. So really, if you're... If your spectrum is limited and your capacity is limited, you're going to focus it on the mobile traffic. Now, today, as 5G is starting up and you've got lots of new spectrum and you've got, spe you've got spare capacity, it makes full sense to use some of that capacity and revenue maximize and use it for, for a broadband service. But probably as time goes, and this is particularly true for the, I think, for the C-band, three and a half gigahertz range, that spectrum is going to be very valuable for mobile. And probably you don't want to be using up huge amounts of capacity on that for fixed wireless broadband, which is getting you much uh, lower revenue per per byte. So probably that's where the probably you, you probably I think a lot of fixed wireless access is probably going to take place more at the millimeter wave uh, spectrum, just simply because you don't want to waste your not waste, but you don't, you want to revenue maximize your your valuable three and a half gigahertz C band spectrum. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely <clears throat> I agree with you. Uh, I think that the difference, though, it could be that you know in rural environments you can still use 3.5 because you don't need as much spectrum. Yeah. So basically, it's the same logic. Yeah. You know, if you whatever spectrum you have available, use it. The millimeter wave, it's uh, it, it works very well. As again, not as a fiber replacement, but as a fiber fill-in or uh, augmentation or extension, uh, because you have so much spectrum reuse that's going to be working and so that's that's pretty good i actually i think that then you know 
then you can bring it to indoors because this is my thing. I think that, you know, you should want to use millimeter wave indoors too, but that's, I know it's a pretty uncommon. Uh, yeah, that's an evolutionary, uh, an evolutionary track at this point. But I remember all the talk about fixed wireless was about getting underserved areas, some sort of service um, because of the cost of running, you know, mm -hmm. low uh, revenue per user networks out to in the middle of Kansas or Oklahoma or something like that. So, that is an evolving part of the fixed wireless access. Like you said, a lot of that can be done in the three and a half gigahertz where there isn't a lot of traffic, um, but it's so much easier to do it with, uh, with millimeter wave, not high frequency millimeter wave, but you know, 15 um, gigahertz and above, gives you a decent short distance hop and a decent in-building uh, or in-home coverage. And I think that's where you're going to see, once everybody gets going on this and gets money from the government, a lot of development uh, in that particular small segment of fixed uh, fixed wireless access. I don't know if there's going to be a lot of it in dense or urban areas um, with microwaves or millimeter waves. I just don't think that's going to be the case. I think it's going to be in a specific use case type situation. Perhaps there's some in the industry that can find that it works, you know, beam data to and from a mountaintop and then make yourself a millimeter wave network within your building to work within the 5G bands. Um, and when I talk about that, I'm actually talking outside of, you know, above six gigahertz for most of this stuff. And that's where I think eventually much of this is going to sort of um, funnel into. I think in the US, you've got more of a chance of having some fixed wireless access in the sort of suburban areas, just because the broadband price points, uh, you know, the fixed broadband price point is a lot higher. I mean, I don't know what the price is of a fixed broadband service, but it's, I'm guessing it's, you know, from what I know, it's, you're talking about $40, $50 a month or something, you know, in yeah, Europe. I get, a, I get a gig for $60 a month and a free um, landline. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So whereas in Europe, you're talking, you know, uh, 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 you know, you know, you're talking, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I, you're talking something like, I don't know, $25 a month for, you know, 60, 70 megabits per second. If you want a full gig, you're, you're probably talking $60 a month, something like that. So, you know, coming in, I'm probably, probably a fixed wireless access solution is probably not going to be the solution for a gig. It's probably going to be, you know, 100 megabits per second or something like that. So you're trying to compete at the price point. You know, you're competing with competition at the price point of 20, 25, $30 a month. And that's, that's, that's just a lot harder to make the economics work in Europe. Whereas I think in the US, you've got more of a chance uh, there of making it work out. I think that, you know, the millimeter way could work, you know, if you have fiber to the street and then you just get to the home because, you know, like my home, I like have wires everywhere, you know, do I really need it? And, you know, that's the kind of thing that I would imagine it's like, you know, the, the last uh, uh, 20 meters. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. And we have a question from uh, Ken Figueredo, who is going to be the next, uh, my next parting partner. So we're going to talk about uh, the metaverse and identity. So he's asking, is there a pathway and timetable for Orrin Sanders to intersect the 3GPP roadmap? And I know there is some work being done to get open run into 3GPP, but it's not trivial and not standard. But that brings up, so you can, Maybe you can comment on that, but also we can t start talking about, you know, Amit's point of uh, open run is open run 6G and what is 6G and just have this the last 15 minutes, 12 minutes of our aspiring partners to just, just uh, speculate on the on the future of uh, open run and 5G, 6G. You know, I can talk about 6G for hours because that happens. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I would do that too. Um, um, but, you know, I'm briefly, my 6G, a lot of people talk about 300 gigahertz and up for 6G. Um, I'm more focused on the terahertz frequency for real 6G. There's a lot happening, and there will be a lot happening over the next five to 10 years inside that 300 uh, gigahertz space, but it's going to be generations before we see anything working in terahertz. And the terahertz 6G is not going to be what we think it is. And um, there's a couple of quotes I have from a couple of, of people I know. One is Ted Rappaport, who you know said at one point, um, is 6G going to be the killer 5G app? And then I have another professor that told me, you know, if we do 5G right, we're not going to need 6G. 
So having thrown all that out there, that would be a good conversation to talk about. I'll back off a little bit. Wow, that's a lot to think about there, Ern. You, you, you know, uh, um, I, I, especially about the genera you know, generational issue where we're all going to be dead and it's like two or three generations. Like that part's a little more troubling. I look at, I look at 6G and I say, absolutely now is a time to talk about it. You know, it is it's time for the right parties, academia, uh, industry, governments to get involved and, and be engaged and starting setting the stage and talking about the standards, absolutely, and investing, absolutely the right time. What it exactly looks like, I don't know that I'm in the terahertz universe. I'm, I'm probably, you know, in the short, short term, I'm probably above 100 um, and see what can be done there. But we may not have the same fights that we're having um, in mid-band spectrum. Um, but what it's going to look like, they always, you know, people describe it as the always on connecting every, you know, part of your, your body function to everything else in your, your living experience is a little daunting uh, from a, from a consumer perspective um, and brings up a host of other problems. But I think it's, 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 it's inevitable. And then you get into the whole metaverse where you're going to need huge bandwidths to, to survive. And I think we talked about that a little bit and previously, you know, in a huge, and, and, and that may be, further down the generational structure than that I'm really ready to guess right now. I, I look at where we are with 5G compared to 4G. So, I mean, 5G has been rolled out very quickly, but if you look at the radio interface, 5G was more of sort of evolution of 4G. You know, it was, it was the OFDM, which is used for 4G, and it was sort of uh, made more flexible to use it for 5G. It wasn't a brand new user interf uh, radio interface in the way that 2G was over 1G, 3G was over 2G and so on, and LTE was over UMTS. So that's why it's been rolled out so quickly. What well, really the big changes in 5G are all are mostly about the core network. This is where the much bigger changes are, are occurring, and this is what's going to support, uh, you know, the, the 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 really low latency times and the, the, the big scale deployments and, and all that. Now this is taking a lot longer to come in. You know, the whole 5G standalone networks and everything is taking longer to come in, and uh, the the the, the whereas the sort of new radio came out very, very quickly. So I'm a bit more skeptical. I think 6G is going to be the point at which all this 5G stuff actually does actually happen. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's a the famous phrase that the curse of the odd Gs in the, the sense that, you know, 2G and 4G have been very successful. Well, 1G, you could argue, was successful, it was just very limited. And of course, 3G didn't, you know, it took a long time to get going. And by the time it got going, we needed 4G to really do what 3G did. So I think 6G is, you know, whatever it, whatever it is in, te, you know, in 2030 is really about going to be getting, delivering much of the vision of 5G in the way that 4G delivered much of the vision of 3G. Yeah. And, I th and I suspect, to be perfectly honest, in terms of frequency ranges, I think we're having enough trouble seeing, you know, how, how much millimeter wave can do for mobile at the moment. I think you know, going beyond even that, I think is 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 a lot further out than, you know, nine years from now. I think it's more, you know, tens of years by the time we're going to be talking hundred gigahertz plus. Mm -hmm. Apart from very very, you know, localized applications. Uh, you know, you know, I don't know, communicating from your your handset to your glass, your virtual glasses or something. That 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 might well be very high gigahertz. But in terms of a mobile network architecture. I just can't can't really see those sorts of frequencies being in there for a while. And and I guess it could be a lot of uh, like uh, device to device communications yeah. as we move forward to to you to to find different use models for a millimeter wave and above spectrum, which right now it's very limited. You know, in the home you just use Wi-Fi for internal communications, and we probably want to move beyond that, <clears throat> or at least beyond that kind of uh, uh, frequencies. We have another question about uh, uh, cell-free massive MIMO for 6G. Um, <clears throat> current uh, massive MIMO is uh, limited mostly to eight users. Uh, and I think that, yes, there's, good. there's also going to be more um, opportunity to use the uh, cancellation so you can transmit and receive on the same band. Uh, so there is a, a lot of changes. Uh, so the thing is that when, when you get to really millimeter wave, um, <clears throat> The need to, I mean, the spectrum we use is so much bigger that, you know, the, 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 same, spe the same amount of spectrum can trans, you know, be used to, um, to, 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 to carry much more traffic. So um, what do you guys are seeing 
in the, in the so I I think I'll, I'll be brief but I think when you start talking about six um, six G and MIMO, I think there's going to be a new generation of um, what I call transmit points out there, and it's going to be something along the lines of the term is uh, RIS or reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, which will take this cell-less concept and make it a reality. Your eyebrow is going to be a transmitter. Your earring. I mean, being a little bit facetious about that, but there's going to be a shift in fixed antenna sites where signals come and go to a completely fluid ocean of transmit and receive points that are going to comprise that particular um, transmitter or that particular network. And I also think we're going to move to a different kind of modulation scheme. Some of these modulation schemes are going to start running out of steam um, when we come to that kind of um, requirement for signal manipulation and there's one out there called OTFS by a company I work with orthogonal time frequency um, space multiplication which is more of a 3D scheme I think you'll start seeing some of those come in combined with these RISs and that will be the next level of what I believe to be uh, the communications network however you want to define that it's interesting what you say about sort of integrating all these the, these different transmitter points because of I think one of the original visions of 5G was it would be a network of networks. So for example, we wouldn't have to, you know, every time we go onto an indoor space and, you know, our cell phone signal is not great. So we want to go onto the Wi-Fi. We have to sign up for the Wi-Fi and all that. And this would all be taken care of, you know, behind us. So we wouldn't have to take care. And that was all part of the vision of 5G. And again, this is the kind of thing that really the core network needs to do. And again, it hasn't really at least today, delivered on any of that. So may, maybe 6G is where this finally does happen. Let, let's see. But I wouldn't de declare 5G, you know, hasn't done that. I would just say it's still early in its infancy. True. I'm really interested to see what happens when, you know, when 3GPPs, you know, re you know release 17, release 18, you know, and some of the, the segments and, and non-telecoms, you know, uh, sectors get in, in integrated. And maybe it's messy and doesn't do what we want to start with. But, it, but it's setting the stage and maybe the, the successful stages, you know, we, we call it we, the age of 6G. I don't know, but it's like, you know, the end of 4G was pretty, you know, darn successful. Even if people think 4G was a, you know, you know, and the end of 3G, I would say the same thing, you know, it was, was pretty successful. So I, I hate to say that anyone was a particular failure. Um, it just, you know, evolution takes a little bit of time. Yeah, that's okay. very, very well said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and 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 we should accept it, and you know, because we always like, you know, oh my God, it's terrible, and 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 now I would like to actually ask Mike about this, is you know, with, with five G, we always perceive that it's like it's a war, you know, who does it first in worldwide, and the thing is that different countries have different needs, so you, you just move at your own pace, and I think that you know, yes, it's doing perfectly fine with five G. Uh, compared to other countries or compared to what we need. I mean, it's clearly some things we could be better, but that's true of everything, right? And <clears throat> same thing with, with 6G. And there has been some sort of a, uh, from some sort of policy uh, attempts, some, you know, to, to get US to have a role in the 6G standardization. What is that you think as a country we should be doing in terms of, I mean, or do we need to do anything specific? Or, because three GPP is not driven by countries; it's driven by operators and vendors. Um, what What do you think our role is? Well, look at I, I. Thankfully, it has done that. Um, there have been efforts to manipulate the process. I weighed in this when I was in, at the commission. Certain foreign nations wanted to manipulate who was on, you know, who was the head, and they had won certain elections. So I hope it stays with the engineering side and with the science and uh, and, and in the right direction. But yes, policymakers see how significant wireless and the future of technology is. And, and maybe they weren't as engaged in 5G set, you know, setting the stage. And so now is a good time to talk about 6G. I think that the efforts in, in the US Congress um, on 6G are, are helpful, wouldn't, would not cause any harm per se. It's about you know, getting a ducks in a row. There's a certain competitive element between nations on these issues. Um, that's certainly true, but there's gonna be a lot of collaborative efforts to um, and so there's there's time for those future fights. It's really about how do you capture the dollars, the significance to your GDP, the significance to your leadership, and making sure that the geopolitical issues you don't necessarily agree with and directions that is gone in some of the early 5G 
um, and, and late 4G in certain countries that had taken off are, aren't able to do some of those things. So I, I'm, I'm supportive of the efforts in the Congress for these things. I think that they're, you know, be beneficial to some degree. But most of this hopefully is done on the engineering, the science, the, you know, and, and the technologists. Um, and we can avoid um, some of the bigger geo geopolitical issues. I think you're still on mute. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I think that, as you say, it's really important that we keep it on the technology side and open, so that we don't have a fragmentation in the from a centralization point of view. You know, one of the things I've always been a proponent of is that we develop future networks on a global scale. It's kind of tough right now, considering the geopolitical, you know, environment of what's going on. But I remember a couple of years ago, I took my phone to China and uh, I ended up having to buy a phone over there because mine just wouldn't work, even though they said it would. And so I really would hate to see 6G evolve um, as a dual standard or as a multi-standard mm -hmm. type of platform. You know, we did that with GSM and CDMA, mm -hmm. not a good idea. So I'm hoping oh. that at some point, everybody will sit down and get rid of all this and go say, you know, in spite of what we do and don't like, yeah, we need to be able to go from the Arctic Circle to the Antarctic and be able to talk anywhere we go. Absolutely. And that, I think, concludes our top of the hour. So I would like to thank uh, uh, those in the audience who have been following us and uh, you guys as well. Thanks to you very much. And over, back over to Kendra. Okay, great. Thank you, Monica. This will conclude our webinar today. Thank you again to our speakers for that great conversation. And thank you to our audience members for the really lovely questions and comments. A recorded version of today's webinar will be available at the senseofphily.com website in the coming days. And you can register or you can access it there. And we have a few upcoming sparring partners. The next one will be January 27th, and that's on managing identity in the digital and physical world in the age of the metaverse. In February, we have a webinar on net neutrality. And then in March, we'll have another webinar on men and women in wireless. And registration for all of those will be available at sensefeely.com in the coming days. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.